Welcome to the Performance and Accountability Board for April. My name is Mark Shelford and I'm the Police and Crime Commissioner for Avon and Somerset. Um, I'm just going to pass around to the room to introduce themselves. First of all, Chief Constable. Yeah, Chief Constable Sarah Crowe. Deputy Chief Constable. Good afternoon, uh, Nikki Watson, Deputy Chief Constable. And my Chief of Staff. Good afternoon, I'm Alice Ripley, the Commissioner's Chief of Staff. Uh, during this meeting, uh, I and my Chief of Staff will be putting questions to the Chief Constable and the Deputy Chief Constable. This is one of the ways that I hold the Chief Constable to account in a transparent way for delivering the Police and Crime Plan. This meeting allows everybody to be able to understand how Avon and Somerset Police are performing. Last month, His Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services published their Police Effectiveness, Efficiency and Legitimacy Inspection for Avon and Somerset Constabulary. This report is probably the single most important assessment that the public see on how the constabulary are performing. This is one of my mechanisms that I can use to hold the Chief Constable to account. With that in mind, the findings of this report will be one of our one and only item agenda today. Forces are no longer given an overall grade. Instead, we are given grades for the different aspects of the police service. So, Chief Constable, please can you tell me what the overall grades were for Avon and Somerset? Okay, of course, um, but I first I think it might be helpful to say a bit about the inspection and the grading criteria that's used in it so people understand what those grades mean. So our inspection process took place between April and October 2022, so the six-month period. During that time, um, the inspectorate came in, they visited several stations, departments, they reviewed documents, they reviewed case files, they attended meetings, they conducted surveys, and critically, they spoke to a variety of officers and staff and some members of the public as well. Um, and as a result of that, they, they gave gradings over nine areas. The gradings they give are outstanding, which means substantially exceeds the characteristics of good performance. Good, which demonstrates substantially all the characteristics of good. Adequate, the force demonstrates some of the characteristics of good, but there are areas of improvement. Requires improvement where there are few indications of good, but there are a substantial number of areas where the force needs to make improvement. And the final grading is inadequate where the inspectors have concerns and make um, recommendations themselves on what needs to be done. So our gradings were outstanding um, for the way we engage with the public, treating them with dignity and respect. We received a good grading in two areas, that was workforce planning um, and strategic planning, our use of resources. Um, we were rated as adequate in two other areas, preventing crime and antisocial behaviour, and protecting vulnerable people. And we were identified as requiring improvement in four areas, crime data integrity, responding to the public, investigating crime, and managing offenders and suspects. We didn't receive any inadequate gradings. Chief Councillor, I'm really pleased uh, with the outstanding grade for engaging with and treating the public with fairness and respect, and, and I want you to pass that on to all of the wider police family that help make that happen. This is really important for the legitimacy and it helps the public feel safe. I also welcome uh, the good grades in developing a positive workplace and good use of resources. However, we are aware that the police will need to make significant savings in the coming years how will you be able to sustain the performance in these three areas? Okay, so uh, as you say, the outstanding and good grades are welcomed. Um, they're a good sign of progress being made, but we do recognise there's a real challenge. 
to turn the required improvements to goods and outstandings as well and to do it in the financial context that you set out. Um, we did have a chance um, to have a look at a draft report before it was published. That's given us a good head start on the areas we really need to focus down on. We've already created an, um, an action plan with named owners and we've embedded scrutiny and oversight and tracking of that plan um, into our internal scrutiny and governance processes. So whether that be our corporate management board, our standards and confidence committee, our improvement in learning panel. So we are already acting. Um, but crucially, and looking forward, we're using the insights that we've got, particularly the areas for improvement, to help us sh um, shape and sharpen what I call is our five-year plan. Um, now, that's an improvement plan that we're looking to focus the whole constabulary on that will take us on a pathway to 2027, 28. Now, that five-year trajectory allows us to plan for investment as well as make savings. Um, we've made um, and identified a sizable number of where those savings can be found, and that's given us some breathing space to be able to look at where we need to invest. And that's critically in those places that require improvement where investment's gonna make a difference. Um, and to do so in a planned and sequenced way so that we don't overburden or overstress the organization, but we, we make something that's sustainable and it lasts for the future. And do that in the, the timescales that the inspectorate works work to. Um, we're also engaging nationally with the College of Policing. It's setting up a new improvement programme which brings in the college, the National Police Chiefs Council and the expertise there, but also the inspectorate and some other partners um, to look at best practice and to help forces where they've got areas to improve and they can learn from others. So we're engaged in that work as well. Thank you. Thank you. So Moving on to the areas that require improvement specifically, um, we've talked previously about the success of Project Bluestone mm -hmm. um, and how it's helping transform the response to rape um, and serious sexual offences. But an area for improvement that's identified in, in the Peel report um, relates to un unallocated cases of exactly that type. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you could tell us a, a bit about that. Okay. Um, well, first off, thank you for noting the success of Operation Bluestone um, because we continue to see really strong performance there and I think there are the indicators there of stronger performance in other areas as well. Um, we're informing and shaping the national work on rape and improvement work on rape and um, we'll see the national operating model published hopefully, definitely, in June this year and a lot of that is to do with what we've done here in Avon and Somerset. Now, the issue that's been termed unallocated rape cases arises from a lack of sufficient specialist accredited investigators. That's a national issue. That's recognised in the report by the inspectors. Um, and it's something we've been working on. And actually, the creation of Operation Bluestone is part of a, a response to that. But we can build those investigators overnight. We need to bring them on and train them. And we're working the college to do that. But I want to be clear about language. Uh, uh, unallocated doesn't mean victims don't receive contact or support. It doesn't mean that there is no investigative action taking place on those cases or that there's no investigative oversight. Um, it simply means that there is no named single officer carrying that case in their workload. Um, now, those cases where there has not yet been a named officer allocated, on a daily basis they're being reviewed by a detective sergeant. They are being progressed and actions are being set and those actions are taking place. In most of those cases, something, and it's an innovation that Bluestone has brought, something called an engagement officer, victim support officer, um, has been allocated to make sure that victim care and safeguarding is also taking place. Critically, we also have a senior officer giving oversight to all these cases. Now, we have adopted that process out of necessity because of resources, but also because it gives visibility on those cases 
so senior leaders see them and we think rather than being lost in a workload where we feel satisfied it's allocated to someone but nothing's happening we have visibility and we're making sure things are happening um, we've recently um, uplifted our bluestone capability we've built it this year up to 119 officers and staff it's now increased in recent weeks to 145 officers and staff at all ranks that should be enough to meet our projected demand so what we're seeing is some pro progress there so I, I was able to get the um, operation we call this operation resolve rather than unalloc unallocated cases um, as of the 5th of April the number of cases in that group were with that extra supervision was 31 now that's the lowest since the process started um, and significantly fewer than the high water mark which was over 100 in November last year which was around the time the inspectors were with us um, as of the coming week um, we don't think that Operation Resolve is going to be needed anymore. We will move back to managing the cases in the normal way, albeit we will be maintaining that extra vigilance and visibility and leadership oversight on all, all of those cases. And that goes not just for the, ra the rape and serious sexual offences cases, but more broadly the cases in, in the investigations directorate. Chief Counsel, if I may just follow up on that. What will your trigger be in numbers that will require Operation Resolve to come back into effect? Um, I, I, I don't, at the moment, I don't foresee a need for there to be a set trigger. We will have, and one of the benefits of, or one of the, the, the characteristics of Avon and Somerset Police is the visibility we have on our data. So we will be watching this very, very closely. Um, as part of our uplift of officers, rebuilding our investigations function has been key. We've, I'm pleased to say, now reached a position where we have all the investigators we think we need for the future. They're not all yet specialist investigators. They're not all ready to take on caseloads. But I don't see us as going back. I see us as building forward. Um, so we will monitor it closely. If we need to intervene, we will, but we haven't set a trigger because we're not anticipating we need one at the moment. Okay. Um, I'd now like to turn to, a, to another area uh, that was graded as requiring improvement. Um, this is about recording data about crime, and this is a conversation that I had a number of times with the Deputy Chief Constable in the build-up to the inspection. This report shows that you are recording currently 91.4% uh, of crimes. It's estimated that you did not record a total of 13,000 crimes in one year. On the face of it, this is shocking. Please can you explain these figures and what assurance can you give me that victims, those 13,000, are not being ignored? Uh, well, first of all, I'd say that uh, crime recording is a very technical business, so we absolutely welcome the independent insight that the, um, His Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary brought, uh, brought to the force, and we recognise that we need to improve. And I'm, I'm delighted to say that the work to, the improvement work is well underway as we speak. So um, having said it's technical business, I think it would be helpful to explain how the inspectorate look at our crime recording. And they do that in a number of ways. So, so they certainly don't have the capacity to look at every crime. They take a, a sample of crimes. They take a sample of the crimes where members of the public have contacted us to report something. And of all of those crimes, they look at three categories. They look at violence against the person, sexual offences, and something which they call all other crime. And they will take a small number of those crimes from across a period of time, and they will look at those. But in addition to that, they will also dip, dip sample our, um, uh, our system where we record information, we record work that we do, um, and, it, and they dip sampled that, that system, and they looked at antisocial behaviour, and they looked at records in relation to vulnerable adults and vulnerable children. They also looked at incidents of uh, rape reporting. 
And then what they did was they checked, of those cases that they looked at, they checked that a crime had been recorded for those reports and those disclosures. Uh, so, of the samples that they looked at, the majority of crimes that they uh, classified as incorrectly recorded were in respect of what we would call behavioural crimes. It would probably be helpful for me to give an example. So if we look at harassment, often harassment may take place in addition or alongside another crime. A practical example of that would be if, if an offender damages somebody's property, uh, you would potentially have an offence of criminal damage. If that offender had a previous history with the victim and perhaps had previously sworn at the victim or done something else uh, in relation to that victim, then the course of those two incidents together could be classified as harassment. And in that case, you would the, an, an officer would be required to record two crimes, a criminal da damage crime and an harassment crime. And on uh, most of our occasions, we recorded one crime. So we had listened to the member of the public, we were investigating, we were safeguarding, but technically we'd recorded one crime rather than the two. <clears throat> so that's uh, one example. And quite a few of the cases in the miscrimes fell into that example. Um, in addition, uh, we absolutely recognise that we need to make improvements in the knowledge and understanding of antisocial behaviour. Because there isn't like a crime of antisocial behaviour. It, it could be criminal damage, it could be assaults, it could be harassment. And we've, um, we've instigated a lot of training for our staff so they can understand better and be more compliant with the recording. The, the inspectors did comment that we're excellent at um, mitigating where we've missed a crime and catching back up and putting those crimes on at a later date. But that's really resource intensive and we want to get it right first time at the time that it's reported to us. So we're making sure that we equip our staff with the knowledge and understanding to do that. We've put some governance in place. We have an action plan to work through all the improvement activity. The action plan falls into four main categories. Those categories are making sure we accurately and properly record crimes of rape, one of the most serious types of crime, in a victim-centred approach, um, putting the victim at the heart of that recording decision-making process. The second area is to identify and, uh, and uh, address those issues around the, the harassment, stalking, um, co controlling coercive behaviour, those crimes where you might need to put two crimes on. The third area is around making sure we absolutely identify vulnerable victims and we get the recording of the crimes in relation to those people correct. And the final area is around that education and social behaviour, getting recording right in respect of antisocial behaviour. So uh, when we do record crime, we record it quickly and efficiently according to the inspectorate, but we need to make sure that we're not missing any. We want to record 100% of crime and there's a huge amount of effort going in to do that. So I'm, I'm going to give you um, a two follow-up questions. One, can you confirm that of those 13,000 no victims have been ignored and two are you can you give me the assurance that the systems now in place means that we record that crime right first time yeah so that well the 13,000 uh, the inspectorate found that we we'd recorded 91.4 percent of crimes correct of the crimes that they sampled so they're saying the 8.6 percent we didn't and then they've looked at our overall crime and they've multiplied it up and so they estimate, so 13,000 isn't a real figure. But what we are making sure is that we have got every mechanism in place to record it correctly first time and give the victims the service that they absolutely uh, require and deserve. We safeguard people and we investigate swiftly. And if we have missed crimes, we have got mechanisms in place now where we get those onto the system quickly, we identify them, and we make sure we are doing the investigation if it hasn't already started. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on, uh, Chief Counsel, as you know, my number one priority is preventing crime. Um, a key way that the police can prevent crime is by managing offenders well. 
However, this was graded as requiring improvement. Um, the report finds that you had overdue visits and assessments related to registered sex offenders. Um, can these backlogs be allowed? So, can by having this backlog, can it allow offenders to reoffend, or are there safety mechanisms in place to stop that happening? Yes, the answer is yes. So. The first thing I want to say is we haven't identified any cases of an overdue visit directly allowing a crime to take place. Um, if those circumstances happened, there would be a review um, and a multi-agency re review of what, what's taken place. Um, the, we don't have any outstanding visits for our very highest, highest risk offenders. The outstanding visits that the inspectors identified relate mainly to medium and lower risk offenders. So to give a sense to, to the public or, or, or who are watching, um, in Avon and Somerset there are 1,907 people who are being managed as registered sex offenders and they all require um, home visits and the frequency of those home visits are determined some, by a risk assessment. It's called an ARMS, Active Risk Management. Um, assessment and that assessment grades people very high, high, medium or low and then the frequency of the visits that take place are determined by that risk assessment so um, if you're very high it may be a monthly visit, if it's low it may be only annually. Um, so it, it's worth saying that as we convict more and more people of sexual offenders, se sexual offences as we are, including those that happen online, those numbers creep up and up and up and add to the workload of our offender management teams. Um, it, so that's the risk assessment process. What we actively manage in Avon and Somerset is of those, those numbers of people, if we identify dynamically any new risk, so somebody coming to notice, maybe to have our neighbourhood teams, um, we will be responsive to that emerging information and we do proactively use online mechanisms and tracking and desktop work to do that as well. So you may be a low risk offender, but if we have concerns about you, you might find that you're being visited three or four times a month. Um, so we are um, dynamic to the risk as well. We, we are committed to bringing that backlog down. Um, we have used the investment in policing, the uplift, to increase the numbers of offenders in the team that deals with registered sex offenders. They're called our MOSAVO team, Management of Sexual and Violence Offenders. Um, I think you mean you've, you've increased the officers, not the offenders Sorry, in sorry the team. no. They are increasing, it's worth saying, the offenders, but we are hoping to um, increase the number of officers available to manage them and keep ahead of that growth. Um, what we've also um, done is we do have offender managers who are skilled at dealing with different categories of offender. So those who may c commit acquisitive crime like burglary. We are developing um, a training package to upgrade those skills because dealing with sex offenders is complex. Um, the package is ready, it will start to be delivered in June. That will increase our cohort of offender managers to be able to manage and, and get down and reduce our ongoing um, backlog of visits to those lower risk offenders. I'm conscious of time, so if the next answer could be um, as succinct as possible. Uh, responding to the public also uh, requires improvement. Can you tell me some of the key things you're doing to improve this? So I'm going to answer. I know how important it is that when the public call us, they, they need us to deal with whatever it is they're reporting. Um, and that absolutely is fourth priority of ours to um, attend and respond within certain time frames and we monitor that on a monthly basis, both the Chief Counsel and myself. So I'll talk about um, probably four areas where we're um, doing some improvement work. The first is uh, our immediate response timeliness. So we're stable in this area, um, but we may need to make sure that we give our frontline officers the skills to be able to respond quickly. For example, driving courses. We have a very new and inexperienced workforce because we've been growing over the last few years. We need to train officers to have these skills. 
the second area I would talk about is, um, although we're excellent at answering a 999 call and best in the country, um, our 101 abandonment rate is not where we want it to be and it needs to reduce. Part of the reasons for that is resourcing of our call centre and um, we're working hard to recruit. The, the pandemic has seen some changes in recruit, recruiting patterns and ways of working. That's caused some challenges for us, but we're being innovative and we're trying to attract the right sort of people to come and work with us to answer the calls so that we can dispatch officers very quickly. <coughs> the third area that, that I want to talk about was what we call right care, right person. It's an initiative that's been um, piloted around the country. Um, I think it might surprise some of the public to know that actually only 27% of the demand coming into Avon Somerset Police is as a result of crime or antisocial behaviour. Many of the things that we deal with, our routine course, are perhaps not regarded as core police business. And we want to work with partners and make sure those calls go to the right agency at the right time. And that will, will I think, free up some time for us. And then the fourth area is technology, making sure that we make the best use of technology. Um, we're using a customer relation management tool to make sure that we very, very rapidly identify repeat and vulnerable callers so that we can give them the best service. So in a nutshell, we're trying really hard to prioritise the resources in the very best way so that we use them to, to maximum effect and respond to the public as quickly as possible. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. The last area that requires improve, last area that's assessed as requiring improvement is investigating crime. Um, so could you um, say a bit about how you're going to address that? Yeah, no, I'd like to talk probably through three main areas. Um, so we want to improve the capacity and the capability of how we investigate crime. So firstly, we're uplifting our accredited detectives. We did have 130. We're doing a huge uplift to 390. And that they will all be, um, well, many of them are in place at the moment, but we're, they obviously go through a program of being accredited and trained. So they, we will reach that 390 accredited by March 2025. We're, in addition to the, the additional numbers of detectives, we're strengthening uh, the CID culture and leadership so we can deliver the very best service. We've realigned some of the leadership structure to improve and strengthen that chain of command and the governance and the accountability for investigative standards. And, and we've, we've talked previously about the learning from Operational Blue, Operation Bluestone and the uh, investigation of rape. We're embedding that learning and then um, transferring it across to other crime types, force-wide. The second area that uh, we're working on is to improve the quality of our investigations. We've established an investigative standards board, which is chaired by one of our assistant chief constables. The purpose of that is to consistently deliver good quality victim-centred uh, investigations, which start from the point that a victim contacts us uh, to perhaps the point the case reaches court, if that's where that case is going. Uh, the actions for that board um, uh, are grouped into three main areas, which I would categorise as more, better and faster. So uh, more positive outcomes for victims, uh, particularly around the high harm crime types, securing those convictions um, that impact and cause the most harm to victims. Better is about better engagement with victims, better uh, case file quality, so that the Crown Prosecution have a good case to take to the courts. And faster is about faster being perpetrated focused, making faster arrests, resolving cases more quickly so that we can better safeguard victims. And then the third area, um, we've just completed a review of our criminal justice functions making sure, because we are just part of the criminal justice process, so we work very closely with partners, but we need to be absolutely um, uh, efficient and effective in our part of that process so that we can then hand on to other partners for swifter justice. Thank you, Chief Counsel and Deputy Chief Counsel, for answering our questions. Unsurprisingly, I'd be keeping a close eye on this. 
And on behalf of the public, I want you to sustain those three areas of outstanding or good. And I want to see improvement in those other six areas which are adequate or needs improvement. Um, we will report back uh, to you um, at future performance and accountability boards. The next meeting is on the 9th of May at 1400. And until next time, stay safe.